meeting of the Sagini Independent School District has been duly called. The notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Section 551.043 of the Texas Government Code. And I will leave this in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. We're going to take a few moments uh, for reflection at this time. Thank you everybody for coming this evening. I appreciate you all. Glad to see you. Sorry my back is to you. <laughs> all right, so the first item on our board workshop agenda is a discussion on the demographic study. And Dr. Gutierrez, would you like to introduce the firm? Bill. Bill. Okay. Good board. Um, President Jimenez, Dr. Gutierrez board. Um, tonight we have a presentation by our district demographer, Brent Alexander. Uh, Brent has done demographic studies for Sabine for several years, several periods over the past uh, several years. And so um, we commissioned this one in, in the fall and he's been working on it up until I think it got finalized maybe yesterday. Um, there were some things that even came in as, as late as like Thursday or Friday. So. Um, the uh, updated presentation for tonight's in your packets. Uh, I think there might have been a couple things different from the one you may have received the other day, but just a couple. Uh, and then um, we'll post this one, um, this, this one on the website after the meeting tonight, um, available for the public. So, um, Mr. Alexander, I'm going to turn it over to him. He's got a <coughs> clicker. And um, also, before we start, I'd like to make sure we welcome. We have uh, many members from the district facilities committee that's here tonight. If you could maybe just raise your hand. Sure, they were <laughs> good. We started working out a meeting with this group, and uh, we just felt like it'd be important because one of the things they asked for was demographic information. So, I'm going to ask them here tonight to uh, to hear the presentation, and then our meeting next Tuesday we'll um, review that and break it down and talk about it. And we're going to have it next Tuesday night. So, uh, again, I want to thank y'all for coming, and thanks for being here and spending your Tuesday evening uh, with us. And so, without further ado, Mr. Alexander. Thank you, Bill. Members of the board, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I hopefully have a lot of good information for you. Um, note that it, it, I've given each one of you a um, report book. It has this. picture data from that we get once a year from our national data source uh, it's from ESRI and they base this data off of census data and they give it to us every July so what you see here are the, the total population numbers for uh, the district um, as of uh, July 2017 so the latest estimate that we have is that the total population in the district is a little bit more than 46,200 people um, over the last seven years, uh, that shows the population <coughs> grown about uh, just a little bit under 8%. Um, if you look at the total number of households, that's 16,675. Um, uh, that is also, that's up about 1,200 households over the last seven years. So you all can see that uh, both population and, and the total number of households are up about 8%. If you average that out, generally over seven years, talking about about a 1.1 percent annual growth rate um, keep those in mind as we go forward uh, one of the things that we look at this data as a as a guide um, you know this is really 30,000 feet data from 
uh, this source. Uh, they're projecting uh, the last few years, the grade has been the, the overall growth rate has been faster, closer to one and a half percent. I think that matches more of what you will see the city putting out on their website, uh, looking at um, you know, 2000, or 2010 and 2015. Uh, numbers, but I know from our last study in 2014 and what we have here, uh, generally we're, we're at about a 1.5 percent uh, annual growth rate. Over the next five years, it's the rate projected rate is, is uh, projected to stay similar to that, if not a little bit faster, 1.6 percent. Uh, you know, down here on the bottom chart on the left, you know, they're talking about seeing um, close to 1,400 more households over. Uh, the next uh, five years, and as you'll see at the end, you know that's a, that's a pretty good estimate from them. Um, we'll go more into the housing forecast as we move forward. The next slide has some additional demographic data on here. Uh, you know, there's a lot on here, so I'm not going to just we're just going to cover a couple things. Uh, you can see that uh, there's the numbers for the district versus Guadalupe County on. Uh, on each one of the categories, um, but one of the one of the things that I think is interesting is that we're going to talk about is uh, the number of school age kids being flat, you know, in their data, enrollment being flat, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. Uh, so also more of the an aging population over 65 within the district. Uh, so those are all things that have kind of all come together uh, to impact. Uh, future or current and future enrollment. Okay, so let's take these next few slides cover the uh, district's enrollment history. Uh, what you see here are the fall uh, snapshot uh, enrollment totals, uh, basically end of October for the last 10 years. Uh, you can see uh, that the district peaked at 7556 in the fall of 2008 and over the last nine years uh, the district is essentially uh, enrollment has essentially been stagnant uh, if you go this past fall uh, 7427 7, was the official snapshot of enrollment if you look back the last 10 years that top chart is the annual year-over-year -year growth uh, the numeric numbers are on the top slide percentage on the bottom We've got five years of uh, decline, five years of growth. So again, up and down, uh, it has basically come back to uh, the last five years has been a negative 0 0.2 growth. So basically flat, right around 7,400 to 7,500 students. So these next slides look at attendance level. Um, here you can see uh, the growth in two year increments since 2007. Uh, I can show you that uh, pre-K, the pre-K numbers are up to 531 this fall. Um, that's the highest that they've been uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, middle school, the number after a few years of decline has uh, jumped up to 1674. Uh, and high school is, continues to be around 20 or 2050 students you know, in flat. But, but what's changed is look at the elementary column here in the middle. That's, that's where the loss has occurred over the last two years, net loss of 200 students. Uh, when you go on to the grade level numbers, which are on the next slide, a couple of things. When we saw that middle school number jump up, the, in the fall of the, at 17, sixth grade had a record enrollment at 576. Uh, seventh grade also at 567, that's the highest total that we've seen uh, since 2004. So there are some grades that uh, have quite a few students, uh, but what is behind that number declining at the elementary are the K through two numbers, which since 2011 have gradually declined. Uh, in fact, the numbers for uh, kindergarten, first and second grade uh, this fall are actually the lowest uh, kindergarten second lowest but first and second grade are at the lowest level that they've been in and this chart goes back 14 years so you might ask uh, well you're going to ask well what's behind that and i'm going to show you here on the next slide but first what what that does is now now the district has a little bubble here in the middle where these grades are averaging about 550 students a grade and then coming behind them now is a group that's at 
five members of students per group. So uh, as we're going to have a little bit of a wave move through, followed by smaller classes um, as these students age up through uh, the district. All right, so what's behind the fall off? Uh, so, well, we look at one of the first things we look at is birth rate data. And so that's what you see here on this slide when we compare it to kindergarten enrollment. The birth rate data is represented by the blue line. Uh, the three main zip codes that make up the district are shown here. Uh, and you can see that from 2006 to 2011, the number of births uh, combined for those local zip codes uh, began on a downward trend. Uh, and kindergarten followed suit. So there's been a, a, a pretty good correlation between uh, the birth rate here locally and uh, kindergarten enrollment. Uh, we don't always see this in every district, but here it follows pretty well. Uh, you can even see that it turned back up and jumped up in 2012. Remember this line has moved five years forward. Um, so the number uh, for 2017 at 501 um, has jumped back up. <coughs> and notice that the birth rate has leveled off again. So going forward, uh, you know, there's potential for kindergarten to remain <coughs> level just based on birth data and at around 530 students. The code survival rates are in your report, um, really there for your reference. Um, one thing to point out when you see this right here, uh, you know, you have a lot of, of grades that are uh, you know, right about 100% survival, but here in ninth and 10th grade, that reflects a lot of students that are repeating ninth grade, so we have a <coughs> low number of, this, this is reflecting how many have moved on from ninth to 10th, and then we have the higher number here, so that's what that, that means. But most, if you're in a, in a fast growing district, you can see the, the, those rate ratios up above uh, one on, on the chart here. Okay, let's talk about a couple things that are impacting the moment as well. <coughs> Uh, this is a statewide thing that's happened uh, the last couple of years. Uh, it's the growth of the public charter schools. Uh, we're seeing uh, multiple districts from districts as big as 50,000 students you know, to you know, much smaller districts being impacted by charter schools. Well, here locally, you have Southwest Prep uh, School that opened in the fall of 2016, uh, and then they, they opened with 93 students that live in Seguin ISD. Um, this chart goes through 1617, so you can see the immediate impact of that school opening. We're waiting for the data for this year. Um, it should come out, last year it was already out by this time, but it has not come out yet. So that school has a capacity of 125 students. They had about 100 students uh, last year. The TEA approved them adding sixth grade, so uh, you know, that was they were they're planning expansion. So one of the trends with the charter schools is gradual expansion. That we're seeing they start out as pre K through five, and then they're eventually a pre K through eight, through eight, and then all the way to pre K through twelve. So you know, does that school have the facilities to do that yet? Um, no, but they're they're incrementally. Uh, planning to grow and it is impacting the lower grades a little bit and so once we see the 17-18 data uh, it should be uh, it should be very telling to see uh, if that number goes from 93 you know up, up and higher. <coughs> Did anybody have any questions about that? So this, this is something that as the state continues to fund um, public charter schools, they're, they're beginning to, uh, it's a, you're in a, in a recruitment battle with, with these other um, um, types of schools. And um, you know, they're, up, they're out there promoting themselves and trying to get you know, a, a different choice for uh, parents that are out there. So, uh, the other thing to remember is the majority of these charter schools are not targeting wealthy students. This is, they're going right after students that are, are your low income students and mostly minority students. That's, that's who's going to these, these campuses. Okay, next couple slides just to talk about um, the results of our, our geo 
coding. So we mapped uh, 7,501 students enrolled as of December. Uh, the dots are the, just going to give you the geographic uh, dispersion of uh, where all the students in the, enrolled in the district live. Uh, you can see that 7,263 live within the boundary, uh, 238 this time around outside the boundary. So uh, there are, you, know, you all have allowed some open enrollment students to come in and, and uh, that's why there's a little bit higher number uh, than we want to saw back uh, three years ago. Now take all of those uh, location dots and use the elementary attendance zones to break it up and you can see here the total number of students that live in each uh, boundary. Now these are the students within only within the boundary. Do not include uh, those outside transfers. And these numbers are uh, again the maps, locations, not enrollment for these, these schools. So you can see that um, out there in the minor attendance zone, that's where uh, the majority of the student population uh, lives in the district. We compared the 2014 geo to the 17 res results on this slide. Uh, you can see that most of the growth uh, over the last three years has been in the Kennedy attendance zone in the southeast. Um, the, the only zone that really lost um, a lot of students is that Jefferson attendance zone there in the middle. You know, that, that area is an older area. You have a lot of mixed people who moved out, people have aged, their kids have aged out. You have a mixture of all of those types of things for why that number is changing. But, but remember this when we, when we start to talk about housing development. Uh, you can see that the uh, more majority of the population has shifted to the east and it's going to change to the west as we go forward. Um, based on the middle school attendance zones, uh, pretty balanced, but uh, the majority are in barns. You can see over the last three uh, years so that the number in the barns tend to be um, up a little bit, right at 100 students. Okay. Um, I know you've seen lots of presentations on Seguin's uh, macroeconomic data. Um, the slides that are in here um, are here just to what I, what I want to reiterate tonight is that the conditions for residential development and housing growth remain very, very good here in San Antonio. They may be all over the state. So that's what I'm showing you here is that the job growth for the region is, is still uh, well above uh, the 20 year uh, average. And, and uh, unemployment in December dropped to an 18 year low uh, at the end of February, 3.4. So basically full employment uh, here uh, in the region, uh, very solid numbers. Um, additional, we go through the different uh, sectors, you see professional business services, <coughs> construction, manufacturing, Let's look at the you know, oil and gas you know, back up again. Uh, so again, all positive numbers. All of this leads to uh, what we're about to talk about with residential uh, development. Uh, the mortgage rates are going up, I believe for four what the 30 year rate is. So this is somewhat of a concern for the building community. And if it does approach 5%, it will gradually start to take some of the, the buyers and maybe shift them down and what they have been able to afford the last several years um, when the rates were under four. But generally, um, and historically, very, very good still. Uh, another thing that continues to push people to new housing uh, or new construction is the lack of supply of resale. That's what you see here, I've circled in yellow. Basically, normal inventory on the pre-owned side is six months, it's been free. So it's very difficult to find a home um, that's existing to sell very quickly. Uh, so people, a lot of people are just choosing to go ahead and build. Uh, in, in, in doing so, the San Antonio housing market's grown to a 10-year high. It's been slow and steady. You can see this housing cycle that started back in uh, 2011, mid-2011 was the, basically the end of the recession. And uh, you can see the gradual uh, increase over the last uh, several years. One of the things that's changing uh, in the market is the builders are beginning to focus more and more on, quote, on affordable housing. Um, what brought us out of the recession all across Texas were 
with higher prices. Um, and you see, when you think about Northside ISD and, and, and you know, sort of so low all the way across, you know, we're talking homes that were 300 and above. Now we're seeing this shift into what is more moderate. Here in San Antonio, that's more 170, 350, that, that area. So um, one of the things the builders are really focused on is getting with the leading edge of the millennials to begin to buy homes. Um, that is the largest uh, demographic group ever. So that group is starting to, to buy homes. They're starting to um, you know, start families and begin to move uh, into some of these areas. Um, so that's that blue highlighted area about the millennials, that age 30 year old group is, is going to, the, buyer, the size of the buyers uh, in the region is going to expand by over 50,000 for some of the, the estimates. Now, that doesn't mean that apartment developers, every, every residential um, type of developer, whether it's a single family or multifamily, are going to go out.
for those higher price points here in Seguin, Iowa. Now here's a picture of the meadows. If you remember back three years ago, this is a field. So that's an aerial picture that we got from the helicopter uh, first week of January. So uh, in addition to the uh, homes here, the Apollo apartments at phase one have been built and the second phase is under construction. And that, that's what you see right, right here. So the activity being led by the Meadows is in Kennedy. 88% of the activity, same thing, barns, uh, tenant zone. And as I was talking about, the, the types of homes here are on the lower price range uh, compared to uh, the region as a whole. The midpoint for San Antonio is now 261. So you can see how this is um, on the affordable side. So it's affordability that is driving uh, the home sales here in the district. All right, so there were no new lots delivered in 2017. Uh, at the end of the year, 240 lots uh, were left. Um, a lot of those are they're scattered out through uh, several neighborhoods and some of them are up in the more of the retirement type neighborhoods like Along Creek or uh, Points in the Queenie, those types up in the northwest portion of the zone. Uh, there's some small number of lots up uh, closer to 130 uh, in the northeast. Uh, but the main thing that we're here to talk about tonight is that in the second half of 2017, there were almost 2,500 lots um, platted uh, in the district. And so that's what this slide here is going to show you. So, so with the success of the Meadows, with all the things I've talked about, uh, you know, builders focusing their attention further out, led by the large production builders like Tierra Horton, uh, we, we are seeing a lot of interest uh, in these tracks that are around the district. Uh, we're really uh, in the city of Seguin, uh, here in the central portion of the district. Now, just to orient you, here is uh, here's the Meadows, here's the 123 bypass, and uh, so the majority of the activity has been down here by Kennecke, uh, you know, over the last three years, uh, here in the southeast. Um, is that Ilka Ranch was the small number of lots that are uh, under de development up in the Northeast. But everything that I've highlighted here is kind of that aqua blue color. Uh, these are, uh, most of these came online uh, in 2017. So there are a handful of them in, that are infill pieces throughout the east uh, side of the district. You know, we have 45, 40 lots here and there scattered through that have been platted for different types of uh, smaller projects. As you can see, 37 lots for Seguin, Seguin Creek and 40 lots for the King Street duplexes and so on. Um, but the, there's been some major ones that have come through here since September. I'm going to start up in the far northwest in the McQueenie zone, the Vista Lago Estates, Guadalupe County. Now this one uh, is 662 40 by 115 lots. Now, this looks like a mobile home community. Um, they don't, sometimes, they don't say that it's going to be that, but it, it says on the plat that it can be mobile homes. That can be a lot of things. If, if it's a regulated mobile home uh, community, you will see a yield that's uh, pretty normal to what we see uh, from single family homes in, in um, in most other uh, other districts, more more on that. In a minute. But Sorry, I if didn't it, hear which community is The one at the Vista Lago Estates. Thank it's you. Right up, it's right up. Here. Now, if it's unregulated, we've seen, especially in Caldwell County, where they had done that, that allowed pretty much anything goes as far as building on these lots. That the yields can jump to double and triple what a normal yield is because you get multiple families living on the, on the land. Um, I do not believe that uh, Guadalupe County does that. I believe they sh it should be regulated, should be more uniform, but with it being 
you know, pretty far out there. We're gonna, that's one of the things we're gonna have to watch. But that is uh, one of the major um, developments. Um, let's just move down 46. Um, Greens Point was one that was new back in 2014. Nothing has really changed other than uh, the developer continuing to at least submit platting to keep keep it kind of moving. It's a mixed <coughs> mixed uh, development. Should have uh, retail components. It should have some larger lots, half acres, um, and some 50s. So it has it's going to have a wide variety of things once it's finally done. It should be more expensive uh, uh, based on what we know today. Now, what what Mr. Lewis was talking about. Uh, the news that kind of broke is that Century Communities out of Colorado announced that the Butte Meadows track, which is the one on the east side of 46, um, right there is it's the Villa Vista Mobile Home Park, right there on the east side of that. They are going to be a developer of that community. Uh, 500, approximately 500 lots. Uh, some of those lots are, the city has categorized them as duplex, but um, Century Communities has built um, you know, they're building in Texas and Colorado, Arizona, and in the southeast, and they kind of have a mixture of um, these uh, types of cottage type products, and they're, they're small homes, and uh, so it's going to be interesting to see if they bring their own builder in to do that like they're doing in the project that's down I-10, uh, the Millican project that's in Converse, so they have another one that's just to the west. Um, that's going to start in the 170s, which they will be the builder in, or are they going to contract with builders like they have in their new projects in DFW and other areas around the state? Uh, so we're we're still uh, thinking that that subdivision comes online sometimes at the end of, of next year, end of 19. It seems like it's moving pretty quickly. It could, if it runs into few delays I, I don't think it'll be much further than 2020 um, they seem to be moving on a lot of their deals um, all across the state. Uh, what age group of families or people usually have been buying into that kind of development? Like older well, older people or younger as a senior community or is it younger families? Or? With that type of product it, it will give you a wide variety of buyers and that and that we're going to talk about that and the yields here in a minute because i think even with the, the express home stuff we're seeing some of that um, different types of buyers in dallas fort worth you wouldn't see as many empty nesters going and buying the starting home but it's a you have to reset your brain here and think hey i might be going from you know a ninety thousand dollar house to hundred eighty thousand dollar house and it's it, it, as opposed to that being the starter home. It, you know, it's a, can be a significant move up here as opposed to other places. Um, but when they do specialized products like that with, with uh, no yards, uh, the yields can be very low for, for new students. More, more, more on that in a minute. Um, so Hidden Brook is the name of that subdivision. Uh, and uh, we're going to continue to watch that, but we have it in the forecast uh, for 2000, uh, in the 2019 season, it's uh, first new homes. Um, all right, so let's jump uh, down to the, to the southwest, um, around Vogel, a lot, of, a lot of activity down there. Uh, number one being the Arroyo Ranch uh, subdivision. Uh, that is 1,103 lots. Uh, this is the next development by uh, W&B. Development, which is the developer of the Meadows. So WB, for you who don't know, um, that is a development company, residential, some commercial, been around 30 years, based in Killeen. Um, they've done hundreds of, of lot, or, you know, thousands of lots, 50 communities, all across uh, the last 20 years, mostly in Central Texas. So they have a group of builders that they like to work with. Um, primarily D.R. Horton. They work with Pulte, their Syntex brand, um, Ashton Woods, and Stylecraft, and then sometimes they'll bring in local builders to build with those. Um, but that is the developer that did the Meadows. Obviously they had a relationship with, with D.R. Horton, so we are watching. And it's been pretty um, tight-lipped about who 
the builders are going to be obviously they're working on uh, uh, contracts to decide who's going to go in there. So that subdivision had the groundbreaking ceremony uh, back in March, so about a month ago. Um, you know, the city of Seguin has been saying that the <coughs> lots would be delivered in December of this year. So uh, there's still time to do that, but it's getting really tight to, to do that. But let's just go ahead and assume that it's going to be spring of 19 selling season. If they get their models done, if they get started here soon, they're open uh, next year. At uh, this time, we start seeing the first move-ins uh, in June, July. Uh, so that neighborhood uh, is essentially a year away. Uh, the, d the other developments that, uh, that the, you know, Bruce Whitus, the developer, has done, uh, those <coughs> developments of that size uh, in the clean area, Temple area, have, they've kind of topped out at 160 homes a year low end 60 to 70 a year so when you see the forecast coming up we're, we're talking about that neighborhood being in that around 100 closings similar to what we uh, have seen in uh, the meadows now we may have to adjust that thinking if they have multiple builders you know and we can they seem to uh, you know, they can prove you know that they can build faster dr horton is really uh, the only builder that is able to to build 30, 40 houses a quarter. So that, and they can they can do 100 units themselves, but we're gonna continue to watch. So uh, the folks at Horton tell me they they wanna be in Seguin, they wanna stay, so that they have not revealed where uh, their next move is going to be. Uh, in addition to Arroyo Ranch, uh, we have some larger lots uh, deals. You know, the, the Sky Valley track that's been there for a decade is still sitting there on 46. You can see the big build up forward for it, it's still there. Uh, you know, it had a, uh, 150 lots, half acres back when it was platted, um, back during the, the downfall, the downturn. Um, but now you have these additional larger lots. The uh, Cricket Post Ranch has 15 lots uh, there on the north side of the of 725 and then Rio Verde which is around uh, the elementary school 120 uh, one acre lots so those are uh, new ones that came in in the fall and that pretty much shows you where all of the 3400 plus future lots so as you can see we're on the cusp of, of major development uh, here in the city of Pasadena uh, so it's going to be interesting summer to see uh, what who the builders are and um, do, do these developments uh, get started as uh, they've been publicly uh, talking. Uh, so, <laughs> any questions on any The Rio Verde, um, that's just right down the street from me, and the sign says it's going to be closed. Well, do you have any other information besides that? No. It is possible that it should be a mobile home. And if they, they come through the planning and zoning and look at single, traditional single family building, uh, then there's the potential for them to end up being moved. So at this point, I've assumed they're single family, a traditional build, but it is certainly possible. So one of the key points is that the district growth or at least from, from a housing growth perspective, is poised to shift to the west. Into, uh, into Queenie, into Reesmeister, Timothy. So here's our forecast. So we're gonna go, we're gonna go through the forecast, we're gonna go through the yields, and then I'm gonna show you the impact on the pasture. So as, as the meadows builds out, that's why you see the decline here and the other subdivisions come online um, here this over the next two years you should see the housing market dip and then grow back towards uh, 250 to 300 homes a year uh, this is similar to what we were talking about at the very beginning where we were looking at 13 1400 from from the national uh, demographic data uh, 
but I have based this mainly on um, what I've seen the meadows produce and what I've seen uh, those types of developments do um, in other areas uh, around the state for this type of product. So, but like I said, there's there is kind of a fluid situation. We got several of these that can build uh, different types of homes on. Them. Uh, but generally, going forward, uh, we have about uh, grow towards uh, 285 homes per year uh, in 2023. Uh, we have the apartments, the phase two of Apollo, those are almost finished. Um, the city also approved uh, the uh, Park West apartments of, for 200 units. There's no developer on that as far as I understand, but that that track is is ready if somebody wants to, to do the 200 apartments. Uh, we're assuming <coughs> this forecast that someone will do that by the end of 2021. Now let's talk about what the houses have yield, yielded. So think back to the flat enrollment. A lot of the houses that have been built um, in this last three years, let's start with the meadows. Um, that 254, that's the occupied count as of September 30th, matched up with the fall geocoding, uh, the yield basically right at 0 0.3. So that yield is, is essentially half of what traditional single family construction yields in most districts across the state. Zero point, it's, it used to be 0 0.7, 0 0.8, it's been coming down as we have more empty nesters and different types of product, smaller lots, uh, so I've used 0 0.65. For you all, the, the, the easiest thing to remember is that when you take all of these subdivisions and put them together, basically you're getting a new student for every four new houses. It takes six to seven houses to give you elementary students. So it's taking you more houses to give you the growth. Um, you know, that, the McQueen outskirts, the Kimbrough, the middle ground edition, those don't have a large sample, but those those yields, not, not necessarily 1.67 at the top, that's, that's high, but the 0.86, the 0.6, those are normal, what we typically see. So um, when we go through the forecast, uh, one of the things, that when, we, when we go through the forecast by campus, one of the things that I want you to remember is that in Express Homes neighborhoods, our experience has been that yield grows over time because a lot of the buyers don't have school-aged children yet. The main target for Express Homes is our young couples, young families, and so it takes a few years for those students to start showing up. That the yields for most express homes neighborhoods end up somewhere in the 0.5 to 0.7 per house uh, range. But often they don't start there. They start at 0 0.3, 0 0.4. So that's one of the assumptions that I've made uh, in the enrollment projections is that we will see children come out of that neighborhood that aren't, that may be very young right now. And so that uh, is a trend that's happened other places and I, I'm betting on it happening here. <laughs> you just know that that's when you look at the Ginnicky numbers here in a minute. But did anybody have any questions on on the yields? I mean, you can see that the more expensive houses, they're not giving you um, any students. I mean, really, the, the number for the Meadows, um, you know, is, is pretty is low. So that's how you can see 352 houses flat at moment. So we've got you've got the, the combination of some aging areas. You've got charter school and we've got low yields all mixed together and the declining birth rate kind of all come together to give you a flat now a flat pattern but going forward um, apartments just quickly on apartments which they're all listed here the two ones that are started those are the most recent ones the walnut grove uh, apartments and uh, oak hollow you can see 0 0.2 0 0.3 very normal these yields are very normal uh, uh, typically 0 0.3 is what we see for, for, for uh, standard apartment developments uh, across the state. So this, these are the uh, moderate and low growth projections. The moderate projections reflect what if the, if the population stabilizes and the additional growth comes in on top of that the kids that are already here. You can see the impact, the 
beginning uh, in it's going to take probably to the 20 2021 school year to start to see the impact from these developments and then eventually grow um, over the next five to ten years again these numbers are based on um, the numbers that I was saying about 100 homes um, in Arroyo 60 or so in Pinbrook they could certainly be faster than that they could be slower but these are uh, based on the, the yields um, I've used 0 0.4 for Arroyo in these numbers so uh, the others have, have been right around that 0 0.3 0 0.4 so again conservative numbers because there's still a chance that you all end up on the green line because that's your long-term historical number if, uh, if you do that you will, the trend of, of being flat should continue for another few years before it incrementally starts to grow but if the housing development um, has a more dramatic impact then i think you get to the blue line which is more of a one one percent annual growth rate which means about a net of 385 over the next five years and around 750 <coughs> over 10 years. What's that do? What's that mean for your capacity? Uh, most of the attendance levels, I've combined pre-K and the, the, the alternative learning campuses together over there on the left hand side. You can see that uh, not really concerned there. Uh, elementary, uh, the total capacity for uh, elementary is just above 3,800. Uh, should be good uh, based on the moderate scenario. Uh, middle school is really the only area that to start to bump up against uh, max capacity. Uh, high school should be good, 2450. Uh, the district should approach uh, 2200. Uh, in the back of your report, uh, report are the individual campus numbers. Um, I've highlighted where our campus goes or reaches 100% or capacity and then exceeds it. So and this is kind of what I'm talking about in the, the Kennedy zone where it grows. Even though the housing is going to stop, it's going to have the apartments and then you should get a little incremental growth uh, as that community ages. Uh, where the majority of those new developments are in Vogel and McQueenie, you can see that they don't go over capacity, at least Vogel doesn't until 2027. The reason for that is that they have very small classes right now, and it's gonna it's gonna kind of do a dip and then rise. So I mean, I've got over 150 kids coming into Vogel over 10 years, and they're still uh, growing to right at 550. Middle school wise. Uh, Barnes technically is already at capacity, uh, 861 this fall. Uh, both middle school are 850 capacity, or is, or is max capacity. So uh, Barnes should uh, be the school that's most over uh, capacity here in the uh, next few years. Uh, then as you, as you move uh, out in that eight to 10 year time frame, uh, both of the schools are right at capacity. And again, the high school uh, should grow uh, you know, up towards 2200, uh, but remain under capacity. And you can see the impact of those smaller five members of 500 size classes. In six years, when they come up, you, you drop 60 kids just as there's fewer kids moving up. Now, there's going to be growth filling in on top of that, but that's still reflected in that, that number for 2023. So kind of have to work through that and then grow back again uh, from there. Okay, I know that's a lot of information, but uh, the main point I think to tonight is that uh, in the last three years, DR Orton has proven that it can sell over 100 houses a year in the district and they're poised to move to another community or another builder. The development community is is uh, is here. They're, they're hard at work. Uh, the city of Seguin continues to promote itself uh, very well. I want to compliment the people that work uh, with the city. 
city markets. It, the marketing material that I see as an outsider, I think is very well done. Um, I think it promotes the, the city very well in a very professional way. It looks first class and on the websites and all the, all the, the information that I see going out. Uh, but the major developers are here. The major builders are here. We're looking. Uh, so now it's going to kind of be who goes where and when. And as you all continue to uh, to work uh, together to make Singing and ISD better, just, just snowball from there. So uh, I'm going to close with that. So do you have any other regulations in the country based on septic tanks and the number of homes per septic tank but there is not a regulation on the number of homes in general per property so you would have to you would just install a new septic tank that's where it gets 
I mean, I've, I've seen all of you in the three on one. <laughs> so the Vista Lago ones, that is not in the city limits, correct? Correct. Is it in the ETJ? <coughs> it is in the ETJ. Because ETJ is, you have restrictions as well. Because I'm ETJ, then the city has certain restrictions for where I'm at. So. Mm -hmm. I just don't know if it goes out that far. Well, they do, because they're going to get, the city's going to get their taxes on it. Okay. Yeah. Two cities are different. Yeah, they go out ETJ. Anyway. No, the ETJ part is way out there, because they, 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 uh, they're fighting with the other. Is that the bond? Oh, sorry. Exactly. Yeah. Insurance and local. Insurance and all that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's what some of the council members are saying. Yeah. Try to sneak about that. As far as you know, this Hidden Brook one is not uh, mobile home. It's not going to have it. You said it's duplexes. Well, it has small lots. Small lots. I can't figure out how you're going to get back there looking at this map. It's on, it's, it'll be off of 46. So even if the survey looks like it will bring you south of the, the existing mobile home park. And then right, okay. Trying to find it. That's what I thought about where the driving range. The driving range, you okay. All right. No other questions back there? Okay. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Thank you. Appreciate your time. A lot of data. Oh. Okay, uh, moving on, we have a budget update. And Tony, I assume you're on board here. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, I don't have in terms of our, our new format this evening, we have uh, our financial advisor, Victor Kuroko, from uh, Frost Financial Markets. He has some information he wants to share. It kind of uh, uh, gives us an idea. This is more of the perspective of the debt service and uh, what the district can afford. So we've been looking at the general operating fund for, for most of our uh, budget season, and that's understandable. But uh, the debt service is also one of the budgets that was really off. And, uh, and there are also some things on the horizon that make this even more of interest to you. So uh, Victor Kuroga will uh, answer questions and give you some information. Uh, honorable president, members of the board, uh, Dr. Gutierrez and uh, Facilities Committee, thank you for having me here this evening. Uh, my name is Victor Kiroga with Frost Bank, and we've had the honor of representing the district as financial advisors for about 13 years now. Um, we're here to uh, only provide you an overview as to the uh, district's financial position um, uh, as perceived by bond investors and rating agencies, these independent sources that if you do decide uh, in the future, if you want to move forward on a bond program, uh, how well those bond financings will be uh, received in the bond market. And so we're here to share with you some information regarding your credit profile, what you look like, uh, 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 and also uh, any what our current bond capacity is, taking into account our property values, our uh, bonds that we already have outstanding, and if we can indeed fit in any type of new bonds, and what would that tax rate impact be on it. Um, so as you can see here, I'm going to talk about bonds. I'm going to, uh, hopefully I won't be, be putting you to sleep. Bonds aren't the most exciting thing to, to talk about. Uh, so some of these slides is, might be information that you've already seen. So I might breeze through them a little bit more, uh, probably focus a little bit more on bond capacity uh, and, um, uh, and, and also what the credit rating is of the district. So um, here are the three sections that we're broken up this presentation on. Um, and so the first slide here, and I think you have a handout too. It might be a little bit easier on your eyes. Uh, but these are the bonds that the district currently has outstanding. Right now, uh, in outstanding principle, the district has a little over $134 million outstanding. Um, you can see there on the far right column for each individual bond issues, that's the final maturity date. That's just our fancy term of saying when these bonds will be paid off. Um, and you can see there some of the interest rate ranges. Um, uh, and, and you see there the titles on the left side, you can see some of these have the term refunding in there. Uh, that's basically our fancy way of saying that's a refinancing bond. And basically you just took an uh, a, a original bond that you saw and refinanced it for interest cost savings. Uh, and then there's also the maintenance tax notes that are outstanding that have a 0% interest. Uh, original issuance was $10 million, right now you owe about uh, $9.3 million on it. 
This is a graphical uh, look at your outstanding uh, uh, interest in seeking uh, debt service. And this is basically the voted bonds that the district has outstanding. And so this broken up between principal and interest here. So you can see there that the, the blue is, is the principal portion and the gray is the interest portion. Uh, but you can see there, um, uh, you see the dips in your annual debt service payments or principal and interest payments as we're paying off uh, bonds in the future. So you can see there, there's a significant dip in 2023 and 24 as we're paying off bonds. And so uh, if there's a slide you want to take a, just like a mental note of that, uh, uh, we'll get back to how we could fit in potentially any type of new bonds considering the fact that we're paying off bonds here in the, in the relatively near uh, future. Uh, the maintenance tax notes have a 0% interest on it, so all you're, all you're making is uh, principal payments on that that's going to be paid off in 2032, so um, that's about $660,000 per year. So this next page, uh, page 7, uh, this is your tax rate history going back the last 10 years. You can see there uh, the maintenance and operation tax rate, the blue uh, shaded one, it's a dollar four for, uh, for a really long time. A couple years ago, the district did a tax ratification election or MNO election to allow you to raise it by uh, two pennies. That passed. So the last two years, you've been at a dollar six for your maintenance and operation tax rate. Uh, the gray area there, you can see um, uh, the impact on the last bond issue in 2013. That bond program uh, necessitated a tax rate increase, and so the INS tax rate portion right now is 36 cents per $100 valuation. That is a tax rate that we could only use. For, to repay principal interest on outstanding bonds that you have. You, we can't use that unfortunately for any uh, teacher raises or anything that, like that. It's just only for the purpose of repaying debt that the voters allowed you to issue on their behalf. This is the property valuation. This is an important uh, factor here whenever we're looking at issuing bonds. Uh, basically this uh, will be the major determinant as to how much you could afford as a school district. Uh, you started about 10 years ago at about $2.2 billion of the property values that were within the district. Those are the property values that you worked with uh, for tax revenues to those tax rates that we talked about. Uh, right now, you're uh, probably about a billion dollars uh, wealthier than 10 years ago. So right now you're about $3.2 billion because of significant commercial development that Seguin has gone through um, in the past 10 years. So right now we're about $3.2 billion for property values within the district. Uh, these are the top 10 taxpayers uh, for the district right now of the, the about $3 billion in property values. Um, your top 10 taxpayers account for just under about $400 million of that $3 billion figure, and this is last year's figures. Um, that accounts for about 13% of your property values are coming from the top 10 taxpayers. Um, the rating agencies like to see uh, a percentage that's a little bit lower like this uh, because that signifies that the district in their eyes is pretty well diversified as to where you rely your taxes to come from. Some other districts that may be not too far that are really heavy in the Eagle Ford Shell play, a lot of those districts are, are not considered diversified and considered riskier to the bond investors because they're relying uh, a heavy portion of their property values to come from these uh, values that could go up and down, and we've seen down in the past few years on, on minerals and oil and gas. And so this is a, a, a good picture and a good position to be in as for a school district in that you're well diversified. You're not relying on a, a concentrated tax base to come up with your revenues to operate the district and pay your debt. Um, this next slide here well, is slide 10. Can, you know, uh, just yes, a huh? can anybody tell me what 8th Street Properties is? It's number four. No, but we could look that up. Okay. Yes, I, mean, so I, I don't know. Yeah, the, a lot of this information uh, is just from the appraisal district, and right. they have the top ten. But I we'll, just thought maybe somebody yeah. would know. No, I'll, I'll follow up with you. Though. Oh, 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 they got oh, yeah. hands up over there. Niagara. That must be the number three. three. Is what it says on Google. Mm. I wouldn't. Oh, was it? Niagara's number three on this chart. No. I know it's the real estate. Could be that 20, he was talking 21st century coming in and buying up a bunch of property. There's been a company coming in buying a bunch of property, real estate. Yeah, so the horse being underneath that. But, but we'll, we'll call the appraisal district and get more information mm -hmm. for you and follow up with Dr. Gates. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so Nick, the legal, according to Google, the legal owner <laughs> of Niagara Bottling um, is, eight, is eight, 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 eight Street Properties LLC. What do I know? <laughs> So, so could it be that that manufacturing plant too that, that is supposed to make cookies or, cookies or no, that's no, it's the it's 
the real estate just company that holds the. Holds it's kind of like HTC doesn't own their. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, no, it's okay. You yeah. brought the roll. Yeah, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll confirm that. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, feel free to stop me at any time to ask any questions. Uh, there's a lot of information here. Um, and the, the next slide here, uh, top 10 uh, employers of the district here, um, that's just information that we received from a, what we call the Municipal Advisory Council. It's just a public database for uh, municipal bond issuers like yourselves uh, throughout the state. Um, then we have the population trend. Um, I, I don't have um, direct access, like democ democracers probably have more updated live figures. This is again from a public data source here from uh, the state of Texas called the Municipal Advisory Council that we rely on to get a lot of this information. But uh, really telling you that a lot of the same information, a pretty stable uh, population uh, trend here for the last 10 years. Um, this here, the average daily attendance, I know in the previous presentation you're looking at uh, enrollment. Uh, we like to look at average daily attendance because that is the uh, uh, figure that the state is going to pay you on whenever they come up with the state formula. So we like to uh, focus on that because it's one thing to have an enrollment and a snapshot, but also how many, what, you know, are the kids coming into the door and, and actually taking attendance for that. So that also, as you know, has been pretty stable, about 6,600 uh, kids in terms of average daily attendance. And that's a figure that the uh, state uh, pays you on for state funding. So again, very stable uh, enrollment. Uh, this is just a district comparison. This is looking at uh, how you compare to other districts that have a similar uh, ADA to you. Um, and also, uh, I told Mr. Hilberg that we can't really compare these apples to apples because all these diff districts are, are different. You know, some districts have um, a larger property value base than you do, or some districts have a smaller property value base. So, and some districts, you know, uh, decide to hold off on bonds. Some decide to move forward on bonds. So again, it's not apples to apples, but it just gives you a little sense as to what other districts that are similar to our school district size, uh, what, how they look like in terms of their uh, tax rates and bonds outstanding. So again, it's not a complete apples for apples. Um, the next slide is something that we like to generate for our school district clients because everybody wants to know, well, how do we compare it to uh, neighboring school districts? And so you can see here, it's not necessarily a comparison as to districts that have similar enrollment like SIGI and ISD, but um, uh, it's just the ones that are in the area. How do we compare in terms of uh, tax rate and, and, and debt outstanding as well? And so you can see there um, where we stand. This next slide, slide 15, uh, this is looking at your general fund uh, history. Um, if, if you focus on any slide, this is probably the most important one if you're a rating agency or if you're a bond investor. This is the big determinant as to how financially healthy a school district is, is, is what's your level of fund balance or, uh, uh, or, or rainy day fund, basically. Um, historically, the district um, uh, has been pretty conservative in uh, having a very large uh, fund balance. Um, in two, two years ago was the last time we sold bonds in, with the public market, and that's when we engaged rating agencies to look at us. Uh, and that was about the time when the district um, uh, determined that it needed to supplement your high school program uh, using a fund balance that you have on, uh, on hand. The good news is that the district at the time had a very large uh, fund balance so that um, even though you dipped into that fund balance, uh, we informed the rating agencies of that, Moody's and Standard & Poor's, where we were trying to refinance your bonds a couple years ago. And so uh, they recognized that even though you, you had to dip in your fund balance, the good news is that it was for a one-time expenditure, as we call it, it wasn't for a reoccurring expenditure, like teacher raises. Uh, and they also recognize that even with you dipping into your fund balance at as a you know, pretty significant level, uh, you still were at a very healthy level in terms of your fund balance. In fact, uh, one of the rating reports we handed to you said that even though you decreased your fund balance by that significant amount, uh, you still were at a very healthy position as compared to other school districts that are similarly rated uh, with Seguin ISD. And so uh, that's just all to say that the, in terms of financially, um, you know, we, we all hate to see the rainy day fund uh, getting dipped into, uh, but financially speaking, the district is still a good shape that if you do need to issue bonds in the future, you won't have any issues 
going into the market and continue to get a quality uh, interest rate for your bond. And so again, uh, good position here. Um, and, and as I said earlier, that's also reflected in the ratings that we were able to attain from Standard & Poor's and Moody's. Um, these are the top two rating agencies in the country that rates municipal bonds, and they also rate corporate debt. But here we're just talking about municipal bonds. These are tax-free bonds for investors. The blue uh, dark column there, that is what we call um, your underlying rating or your true credit rating as a school district. Fortunately for Texas schools, the TEA has a program called the Permanent School Fund Guarantee. And uh, that's a really new program that's only available to schools and not to cities or counties here in the state of Texas. Basically, what the state allows you to do is that if you're a school district and you need to issue new bonds that are voted in by the community, they allow you to use their credit rating, which is a AAA rating, when you're out there trying to market your bonds. So what that means is that we're using their natural AAA rating off of the Permanent School Fund Guarantee, attaching that rating to our bonds and marketing them to bond investors. Now, what that means as, a, as, a, as an issuer of bonds is that the higher the, the credit rating I have as an issuer, the better interest rate I'm going to get. Kind of like your personal finances, the higher credit rating you have, the better interest rate people are going to give you and more banks are willing to lend. Same thing for the municipal bond industry is that the higher the credit rating, the better interest rate you're going to get. Now we have two ratings though because after the financial crisis in 2008, a lot of these bond investors, which tend to be very large insurance companies or mutual funds or, or large banks that buy municipal bonds, um, they are requiring to not only know the AAA rating from the permanent school fund guarantee or the state's rating that you're marketing your bonds to, they also want to know what your underlying credit rating is and that's your true credit rating. So right now, um, if we were to be in the market without the permanent school fund guarantee and the AAA rating, uh, we would be rated and are currently rated in the AA category there. You can see that a standard and poor rates us at a AA minus. Uh, and Moody is at a double A3, which is synonymous to the double A minus there with standard of pours. And so that's all to say that whenever you're in the double A category there, uh, that's very uh, a good to have. Uh, there's other districts that don't fall into there um, that are in the single A category. And so what that means is that if you're in the market, uh, bond investors are going to be probably um, uh, more leery, I guess, to, to uh, participate in those bonds and therefore have a little bit uh, higher interest rates. Um, uh, Mr. Alondota had a, a great question yesterday during the budget committee uh, meeting. Is, is, you know, how, how are these credit ratings come, in, uh, come up with? Uh, well, there's basically, if I could just briefly describe it to you, uh, the, it's, it's basically in two categories. It, the first category is things that we can't control. We can't control how many kids are coming to the school district. We can't control uh, what the uh, commercial entity that wants to relocate is you know, coming here. You know, those are things we can't control. We can't control property valuations. Uh, so they judge us um, heavily on things that we can't control. And then the things that we can't control, we're also rated on. And what can we control? How conservatively we're budgeting, uh, if we're managing our expenditures. Um, you know, those are things that we can't control. And so uh, they take a look at both of these and decided that Seguin ISD, uh, uh, the past few years, um, has been credit worthy enough to fall in that uh, AA category, which as a bond investor, as a financial advisor, as a credit rating agency, that's a very strong uh, rating category to be in. It's, it's, uh, it's very strong. And so that's just all to say that y'all are in a good credit position uh, currently. Trinity, do you feel that we're going to stay there or even advance? Uh, and that's another great question, Mr. Rondota had uh, yesterday at the budget committee. So, so what can we do to increase that? Because everybody wants to increase that. Um, you know, right now in the state of Texas, uh, there are no, um, at least in, in Moody's eyes, there are no naturally AAA school districts. All school districts don't naturally fall into that. So really, you're, you're almost at the top already, so there's limited growth to go up. Um, but basically, w w I if you get a chance to look at the rating reports there, uh, they give you indications to what we, what, they, what, what could make the ratings go up. And basically, what the common theme is from Standard Poor's and Moody's is that really, if your property values continue to grow at a significant clip as they have been in the past few years, then at that point, they might uh, consider raising your credit rating. But then they also give you, uh, you know, again, bond investors are relying on these credit agencies to tell them the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And so they, they show the strengths of the district, which right now are strong financial positions, your healthy property values within the district. Um, but then they also are, 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 are tasked to find out what the weaknesses are of the district. 
And so really the only one that they cited is, is, is that if we uh, continue to dip into that fund balance as those large clips that you had one time before and you deteriorate those fund balances uh, and make them less to what other similarly rated school districts are, then at that point they might take action to decrease uh, the rating. But uh, at, at this point, at least from our perspective, <coughs> we know of no intention that the district is planning to, um, you know, deplete its fund balances any further. Does that answer your question? Okay, now let's go to the, the exciting stuff here is the uh, bond capacity. We know that the district overall is in a pretty good uh, financial position. Um, so the bond capacity, and, and this is a similar uh, 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 information on page 18, what the gentleman before me showed you, is uh, interest rates. Um, here in the past year or so, year and a half, interest rates have been going up, and people in my industry in the bond industry have been whining a lot because, it, you know, whenever they go up, there's less bond activity occurring, there's less refinancing, there's less um, inclination to issue new debt. But then I like this graph, and this goes back to 1980 because this gives you a perspective as to, um, historically, we're still um, uh, in a pretty low interest rate environment. Even though interest rates have risen a little bit here uh, in, in the near term, uh, if you look back to the 1980s, school districts were issuing bonds at 14, 15% interest rates. And so, um, again, you know, it's, it's, interest rates are rising, but if we were to issue a 30-year bond uh, today, we would probably lock in a fixed interest rate of about 37 to 3.8%. Again, this is 30 years fixed locked in interest rate. And so that's, anytime you're below that 5% threshold, um, that's pretty uh, attractive. And so we're still in a good, pre pretty good place, but you know, I don't know what interest rate is gonna be doing six months or a year from now, but right now we're still pretty much near the low. Yes, ma'am. Can you just define the term bond capacity, please? Yes, uh -huh, absolutely. And so let me, maybe if, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna skip this slide here that's just market news and, and things like that. So uh, you can read that at your leisure. Um, and well, let, let, I'll just answer your questions. So I won't get too far. But basically bond capacity is based off of our property values and based off of state law, what is the maximum amount that we could borrow right now? So that's a maximum amount recognizing that we already have bonds on the books, uh, the property values that we get to work with right now to take care of those existing bonds and possibly afford new bonds. Basically bond capacity, what that means is how much can we financially and legally issue as a school district? What's that maximum amount? Okay, that's what I thought, but I wasn't yes. sure. Yes, ma'am. Hi, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in the next couple of slides. And so uh, slide 20, uh, my role, I'm not the actual bond investor or the lender for any of the bonds that you have outstanding. Uh, my role as financial advisor historically has been to the to basically take, whenever the district needs to issue bonds or refinance bonds, we take you through the process, make sure all the steps are, 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 are correct. And, 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 but basically my main job as financial advisor for my clients is to get you the best interest rate possible so that we could reduce the impact to the taxpayers as much as possible. So so really, at the end of the day, my, my, my job is to get you the best interest rate on your financings or your refinancings. And so we're pretty much an extension of your finance department that only deals with bond issuances when you need to um, address new needs. And so uh, you all are already aware of this. We have maintenance and operation tax rate and also INS tax rate, where as a taxpayer, we don't really get to see this breakdown. All we see is a total tax rate. And so the combined one that we talked about earlier at the dollar 42, uh, the bulk of it is going to be your maintenance and operation tax rate. Uh, legally, we could go up to a dollar 17. Right now, we're a dollar six. Uh, the INS tax rate, this is where we get into bond capacity. Under current state law, uh, if I'm a school district, if I want to issue new bonds, I have to prove to the Attorney General that, uh, that our tax rate, whether now or 20 years from now, based off of the information that we know, uh, that INS tax rate is not going to exceed 50 cents per $100 valuation. It's what we call the AG test or the 50 cent <coughs> test. And you might be asking, well, what does the AG have to do with this? Well, the process to issue new bonds is that as a school board, if you decide to do a new bond program, you first have to call the election. You're going to ask the voters for their approval to do a new bond uh, for whatever project you decide you need to do. Uh, so you get the approval from the voters. Then after that, it's up to the board as to how and when you're going to issue that authorization that the, that the community gave you. But the final authority here in the state of Texas when issuing bonds is the Texas Attorney General's office. They review all the legal bond election documents and bond sale documents. And this is the test that they have specifically for school districts in that where they, they, they have a cap here in the state of Texas where if you're gonna bust that 50 cent test, 
then they're not going to issue let you issue these new bonds and so this is where we get the 50 cent uh, threshold and this is where we come up with the bond capacity figures that we're going to share with you uh, here and so um, the attorney general for this 50 cent test they're not only looking at this upcoming current year if you just got bonds approved and you're going to sell them and the tax year is going to happen next year they also want to know what's the tax year going to be 10 years from now uh, but the thing with this test is that we can only use the property values that we know of today um, and so, uh, based off of the fact that we have 36 cents right now in your INS tax rate to pay for the existing bonds uh, that you currently have on the books, that leaves us about 14 cents to work with if you decided or to determine what your bond capacity is. Um, so what does the 14 cents give us uh, for that remaining bond capacity? So we ran different numbers. I'm just going to look at the 30 year figure just to cut down on the time of my talking. Uh, but if we look at a 30 year, I'm being very conservative. I said earlier, if we were issuing bonds today, we could probably issue them for about 3.8% interest rate. Here I'm using about 4.5 just to be conservative. I don't want to, uh, I, I want to give you the worst case scenario. So right now, the 14 cents basically gives us about $73.5 million. That's more on the conservative side. Um, and so this is, this is using a very also conservative repayment schedule where we issue, let's say we do a 30 year bond, we're gonna start paying principal on year one. That's what we call a, a level repayment schedule. So again, these numbers are pretty conservative here. Uh, so 14 cents using a very conservative repayment structure and interest rate gets us about 73.5 million dollars and at that point we would reach the 50 cent capacity uh, now that's not going to be fixed in forever because hopefully like all the other districts in the state of texas your property values are going to continue to grow and so your tax rates have an inverse relationship with your property taxes is that as your property taxes grow you won't need to have a tax rate to come up with the payments that you have to pay to your period bonds so hopefully that won't be the case where you're at the 50 cents for forever and you're locking in future boards of being able to do anything for bonds so um there, there's other ways to structure your debt uh, you know if, if we were to go to a bank and we wanted to get a car loan or a mortgage we're really at, at the at the mercy of the lender as to what the repayment structure is going to be here for school districts that are issuing uh, tax-free municipal bonds, we get a little bit more flexibility as to how we're gonna structure our, our repayment schedule. And so what does that mean basically? Well, we don't have to do a repayment schedule that's gonna require a higher INS tax rate than you're willing to take to the voters. We could structure debt uh, so that uh, our focus will be to try to minimize that tax impact on the new bond program. Uh, and, and, and there's a way, there's a structure, what we call a wraparound structure. Basically, we're taking this new debt, and you recall that graph where we're paying off bonds, you see there's holes in the future. Basically, there's a way to issue new bonds and wrap around your new debt around the fact that you're going to be paying off bonds in the future. So what does that mean, basically? Um, that means that you could structure your debt and you could uh, delay principal payments until you start paying off the existing bonds that you have. Now, why would you do that? Yeah, that's not probably the most prudent thing that you want to do because you're probably going to incur a higher overall interest cost after that 30-year period. Uh, but, but again, um, some districts solely focus on, on tax rates and, and that's all they care about. They don't care about what the 30 year payment is gonna be. They just wanna make sure that the tax rate is manageable for the, for the taxpayers. And so that's what a lot of these, some of these districts do uh, is that they focus first on the tax rate and then they kind of work backwards and see, can we delay principal payments on the new bonds to, to uh, wrap around these, this new debt around the, the fact that we want to issue um, uh, or pay off the, the existing debt. So basically there's ways to structure where you're just focused on the tax rate, you're trying to minimize the tax rate, but you're still getting bond proceeds to work with on any new projects that you may have. Um, now, it's just a, as a disclaimer here, these, all these bond figures that I'm talking about here, uh, these are all just what-if scenarios. Um, uh, the, the staff did not tell me, okay, we need to do X, Y, and Z project, and it's going to cost us X, Y, and Z, and so run numbers for that. Uh, the, the, this was just an exercise. We just want to see what we could afford and what the tax impact would be if we did a, a, an alternative repayment structure. And so here, using that more alternative repayment structure where we're delaying principal a little bit, um, and, and our main goal is to try to minimize the tax impact of a new bond program. Here, what if we wanted to keep our INS tax rate at 36 cents and do a new bond program uh, and not cause an INS tax rate 
increase to the taxpayers. Well, using these more alternative repayment structures that you have uh, options to, uh, you could issue about $15 million and do what we call a quote unquote, no tax rate increase bond election basically. And again, all we're doing here, it's not magic. All we're doing here is we're just uh, delaying some of the principal payments on this new bond program and fitting them in after you pay your existing debt. This is a way, again, uh, to just try to minimize that tax impact on the taxpayers and just uh, uh, make it more manageable in terms of the taxpayers. So what if we do that same exercise? What if we say, okay, we're at 36 cents for INS tax rate calculation. What if we're comfortable with increasing and asking the voters for an additional penny and taking it from 36 cents to 37 cents? How much does that get us? Well, right now, that gets us about $25 million. Uh, and you could increase the INS tax rate by a penny. Now, um, one thing here is that we are using these alternative uh, repayment structures and we're also having to probably issue these bonds over a two year period. Does that mean that you have to do uh, two bond elections over two years? No, the way it works is that you would ask the community, you would identify <coughs> projects and you would uh, uh, prioritize you would ask them, let's just say for example, say for $25 million, um, uh, we would have to probably sell these bonds over a, a two year period, which is probably okay anyway because most districts can't spend $25 million in a 12 month period. It's gonna take some time for whatever projects you decide to do in the future. So uh, again, I just wanna let you know, I don't wanna put uh, high expectations that we could get $25 million automatically. It'll be over a two year period, but right now you could structure it so it's only one penny uh, tax rate. So there are limitations to that alternative structure. Uh, this does not mean that if we do another penny, it's gonna be another, uh, 30, uh, another $10 million and you would have now $35 million for two cents. Uh, we ran it uh, earlier today. If we did $35 million, that'll probably be about uh, another penny and a half on top of the penny. So you're looking at probably about two and a half pennies. Uh, for $35 million, but uh, we're here at the disposal of the administration, so they want us to run different uh, bond figures as we get closer to prioritizing your needs. If you decide to address them in the future, then we could run numbers for you. And that's just using the alternative method. What if you were straight up just the standard would we be looking at a lot higher? Yes, sir. You'd be looking at a okay. higher uh, a tax rate. So it's just a, a balancing act. There's not a uh, really, um, you know, if you're like judge it on the spectrum, this is probably one end of the spectrum, and then the other option that I showed you is on the other end of the spectrum. It's not to say that you just have those two options. There's always things in the middle where you know you, you maybe want a five cent increase, but you still want to do twenty five million dollars. There's a way to structure that. Okay. Uh, so, so again, I don't want to say that these are your only options. There's other options. We're just wanting to show you both ends of the spectrum here mm -hmm. as to what you could potentially do for a new bond program if you decide to do this. And so this is just uh, the unlimited tax pool building bonds whenever school districts have a bond election. These are the financing tool uh, that's allowed by the state for you to issue and just provides the most flexibility. You could only have access to the state's AAA rating if you have uh, voted bond issues. Uh, so that's the only way you could use our AAA rating. Uh, here in the state of Texas, we currently have uh, bond elections twice a year. These are on the uniform election dates in May and November of this year. Uh, it's too late to approach the May election. The earliest you could do a bond election if you decide to do one would be November 6, 2018. Uh, under current state law, uh, the board would have to call that election if you wanted to be on the November ballot uh, no later than August 20th. And so the information that you need to have as a board to uh, shoot for the November election date, you would have to call it no later than August 20th. That could be a regular meeting or a special call board meeting. You would need to know two things. Number one is what's the maximum amount that we're gonna ask the voters for, the dollar amount, the bond amount. And number two, uh, you need to identify the projects that you wanna work with. Uh, or, or, or cite in the, um, and, and, and do for that bond amount that you're asking for. And some of these factors, again, th this isn't anything state law, this is just from what we've seen our other uh, successful school district clients do when they have bond elections. Uh, a lot of this you've actually already done, your facilities committee has already been meeting and talking about the potential needs of the district. Uh, we've already ran some preliminary numbers for you, kind of show you different options. Uh, as I stated earlier, as you get closer, if you decide to do a new bond program, as you get closer to it, um, then we're at the administration's disposal to uh, run additional numbers if there's a specific dollar amount that you want us to solve for and give you different options for uh, what the tax rate impact would be, then we would do that uh, as your financial advisors.
Uh, just to experience with this district, this is just information we shared with uh, uh, Dr. Buchanan when you joined. Uh, we've been fortunate, we, we've conducted about nine financings here for CDNISD over the past 13 years. Uh, but most of those have actually been refinances. I can't take all the credit for it. A lot of it is the bond market and interest rates, how low they have been. We've just been able to take advantage of them and inform the district when it would be uh, that we could um, uh, refinance your bond. So most of the bond issues that we've actually done for the district have been refinancings. And so these are the five refinancings that uh, the district has um, conducted since 2006. Uh, you can see the principal amount that we refinanced and also the interest cost savings on the far right column, about $7.5 million in interest cost savings. And again, uh, you know, I can't take credit for that. A lot of that is just the bond market and interest rates being so low and the district being able to take advantage of that low interest rate environment. Uh, just uh, information regarding our other clients, a lot of them are from the area and a lot of them are school districts. Uh, those are my real estate pictures that they make us use. <laughs> and just uh, information on that. I've been very fortunate. I've been practicing for about 18 years now, uh, and now associated with Frost. But um, I know that was a lot of information. You had a lot of information before then, but I'll be happy to answer any more uh, questions you may have. Are all of our um, current bonds, are they at the lowest rate that we can possibly get right now? Or? Yes. Uh, and that's a, a good question. I don't want to uh, get too, too technical. I'm just going to go to that slide if it's okay. So I said earlier, uh, bonds are long-term debt and they're very much like mortgages and that's the way we explain them. Uh, but bonds are unlike mortgages where they're highly regulated by the federal government because these are tax-free. Uh, and so whoever buys these don't have to pay federal income taxes. And because of that, the IRS highly regulates these type of bond issuances. And so we not only have to follow state law, but also federal law. And one of the restrictions the federal government has on municipal bonds and what bond investors expect is that if you issue a long-term bond, let's say a 30-year bond, where standard in the bond industry is that the first 10 years, first nine to 10 years, um, those bonds are what we call non-callable. What that means is that uh, we're promising the bond investor who bought the initial bonds that we're, we can't refinance that bond or pay them off early in the first nine or 10 years. That's just a common feature that bond investors have been expecting for, for many, many years. Uh, that's not to say that you can't do a shorter call feature where you have a prepayment option at that time. The only thing is just like anything else, if you get a little bit more flexibility, they might give it to you, but they might raise the interest rate that they're going to offer you. So to get really the best interest rate possible, a lot of school districts are having that uh, call period or call protection uh, the first nine or ten years. And so um, uh, here you can see the call date on that slide, the second column here. Uh, that's the first available date that we could uh, refinance these bonds again. And so this is all going to be dependent on what's outstanding and what's... So as we get closer to the date, what we've done the last five times for the district is we've seen that we're getting close to that day and uh, the economics works in to the benefit of the district because of low interest rates. And at that time, we advise the district it might be a good time to refinance your bonds. And so that's what the call date means right there, when we could prepay these bonds or, or refinance them. And again, all, these bond, all the bonds that the district has outstanding, they're all fixed rates. Again, the district's been pretty conservative with its financials in addition to uh, the bond structures that you've done in the past. All these are all fixed rate bonds. You see some school districts that do variable rate bonds and are taking some risk. Uh, the district has been pretty conservative with all its bond issues because they've gotten fixed rate bonds on these, or fixed rate interest rates. So on the interest rate, when it says like three to 4%? Yes. Yeah, or is it 4%? yeah, it, it's actually both. And so um, uh, uh, when you issue a bond, and let's just say you do 30 annual payments, so really the way to look at one bond issue, it's really, it's probably, it's 30 different loans. And so just like a mortgage, where if I had to do a 15-year mortgage, I'd get a lower interest rate than a 30-year mortgage. Well, here, when you issue a 30-year bond, you're actually doing both, because as a bond investor, most bond investors aren't going to buy the whole thing for their portfolio. They might say, well, I need a bond that's going to mature two years from now. And so to them, that's a short-term loan, so you're going to get closer to that 3% range. But if an investor out there says, well, I need a bond in my portfolio, I'm an insurance company, I need something that's going to mature in 25 years, then you're probably going to be closer to that 4%. But it's all going to be fixed, and whenever we present to you the results, whenever we issue bonds, we always show you the average fixed interest rate. So that 3.8% that I shared with you earlier, based on today's market, that would be a, an average fixed interest rate on your 30-year bond issue. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
other questions? Do you have any questions back there? I was wondering about those QZAP reports that are at the end. Uh-huh. Those are, are th those are maintenance tax notes as um, at the end of the presentation. Oh, that's I'll I'll be going over that oh, okay. in a second. Yeah, that's actually not under cover of oh, okay. the presentation. Okay. Uh, if there's any other questions, I know it's a lot of information. If you all think of any other questions, uh, Dr. Gutierrez, uh, Mr. Hilbert know how to get a hold of us, and so we'll be happy to answer those. But um, we're here to help in any way we can. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll, we'll go into that now. Um, what I wanted to share with you is uh, the, the current standing um, for the, the QSAP note, the QSAP, which was partially disclosed in, in the information that Mr. Perrotta shared with you. It's a $10 million issue, interest-free, it's a 15-year payback. It's out of the general operating fund, not debt service. So uh, this portion of the workshop is actually going back to the general operating fund whereas everything Victor was talking about was, was associated with the interest in sinking or debt service fund. Um, so getting into that, what I wanted to share with you here is we've been going through the budget process for the general operating fund and we've been gathering uh, data for uh, everything associated with, with the last few years and all of the expenditures that, um, that we've aggregated as a district for each of the different campuses and each of the different departments and uh, we have a baseline allocation for, for each of those portions of the organization. And so when we send out the original budget um, documentation to each of these subcategories of the organization, we ask them, is that allocation still sufficient for you? And if not, what has happened that requires additional allocation to you? And so depending on the nature of that request uh, sometimes it's discretionary other times not so much um, so we're, we've gathered most of that documentation now and in the process of that we've been looking through uh, some of the things and identified that some of them actually qualify as QSAP items the reason why that's important is because we have a limited amount of time in which we can spend those QSAP dollars they all have to be spent by October 2019. At the very beginning of the uh, budgetary process for QZAP, um, there was a, um, sort of a, an idea of a budget. Everything wasn't earmarked from day one. It's impossible to do that. Even the TEA application, they give you a, a box that's about a two by two inch square and they expect you to explain how you're gonna spend $10 million. Well, Needless to say, a lot of it is uh, speculative at that time. But, but over time, in working with the maintenance department, um, and, and also in keeping in mind what's happening at the high school, uh, we've identified things that qualify for QZAP, and so we formalized the, the budget pretty early on, just not from the very beginning. Um, and so every week, whenever I send the, uh, the business department's portion of the school board update, you're seeing a QZAP update that just reflects your subtotals. And so, uh, Bill, if you could scroll down just a bit for me, you can see uh, these subtotals on this first column represent the things that were associated. And if you go all the way down to the bottom of this slide, you'll see that it, it references the $10 million. Now, there's a couple of things I want to point out before we move forward. And that is, in all of the updates that you've been getting up to this point in time, there actually was about um, a hundred and well, ninety thousand dollars of unallocated um, budget. And and what the reason for that is because there has been interest that has accrued. So this ninety thousand dollars that you're seeing in this column here, and I'll explain why I'm showing it this way in just a moment. But that's related to interest that has been earned on the non-spent QZAP dollars. So uh, we right now in the in the bank account have about two million dollars unspent. And uh, but you know that that's that's not always been the case. We started with ten million, now we're down to two, and over that course of time, we've earned ninety thousand dollars. So we have to budget that back out. In addition to that, 
originally, and in all of your updates, if you go back to your, your last update, which I believe was dated April 4th, um, we didn't have all 10 million identified as to where it would go. There was about another $22,000 of unallocated budget. Uh, I wanted to just kind of move that at this point in time up to, along with the, along with the interest earnings, up into just one line item, in this case, stadium improvements. Not to say that that's where the budget would stay, but just to get everything budgeted so that you kind of have an idea of, of um, what you will have left once we do what we're recommending next, which is to reallocate some of the dollars. Because not all of them have been spent. Some of the initiatives either are no longer relative or some new things have come to light as a result of the budgetary process. So if we go to the next slide, I'll explain what we're looking at. In the budgetary process, um, one of the things that has come up, the maintenance department is asking for HVAC controls that are very critical in two of our elementary campuses. Now, I know that there's a facility study going on right now, and one of the things that we wanted to be sure of is that if we use QZAP dollars on something that has anything to do with facilities or construction, that it would not be rendered obsolete if, for example, you were to go in and completely redo a building. Okay, so HVAC controls qualify not only for QZAB, but they're going to be uh, useful no matter what HVAC system you have, even if you were to completely replace it. Because the, the controls do, and I'm not an expert, but um, James has educated me to this, a limited degree. But they allow you to basically control the HVAC unit from a remote location, and that could be done here in the, in the central office. And that's what they do, or try to do district-wide. But apparently these are uh, in, in, a, in a critical state of disrepair and $250,000 is what they're estimating would be required uh, to, to take care of that project. We also have some playground updates that are um, sort of in line with the, the LINK program that has is a new initiative for this year. Um, there was actually a lot more requested on playgrounds, but um, we felt like the $40,000 request was one that, that could be reasonably facilitated at this time. And, and again, it doesn't all just chime in too, and, and that's, that's a, a request that is coming from, from Pete Silvius. I'm not hearing you more. Um, but with the whole child initiatives, but in, in working with my superintendent's advisory team, most of the feedback that I did receive um, when I toured with our students at the elementary campuses, most of the concerns, because they were able to share concerns with the facility, um, was with the playground equipment. Just an extra There's also some critical need for custodial equipment, and um, we went ahead and, and, and looked at this as being a one-time cost similar to uh, an assignment of fund balance for a one-time cost, you can use QZAP in a, in, in a, in a line uh, similar to that, and it does qualify because it would be custodial equipment used at campuses for students. And then, of course, as you all are also aware, we have the safety concerns, the security entrances that we want to do at HAP and Barnes. Those could be funded by QZAP. So you've got one, uh, a million seventeen thousand and what we're recommending as a reallocation of the budget of QZAP. So if we go to the next slide, I'll show you how that looks. They go down about to the middle. And as you can see, um, I've, I've tried to identify them by means of, a, of some stars, 18, 19. What we're saying is anything with uh, an indicator such as this, those are tied to those recommendations that, that I just showed you. Um, and keeping that in mind, what we've done is we've reallocated the monies from the stadium improvements, which was previously um, you know, close to $2 million on this line item. We've bought that down to the tune of uh, now to 560000 so that we can move forward with these items um, you know, that we've just explained. And the reason for that is because uh, to take action on the stadium at this time, 
uh, and actually do that by October 2019, um, there are some questions as to whether that, that's going to happen. So, so reallocating that money is what we're re requesting that, that we would go ahead and do for this year um, and moving on into 1819. So at the end of the day, if you scroll down, Bill, to the bottom of that, please. Um, thank you, sir. It doesn't change anything. It's it's still we're we're still scheduling ten million ninety thousand nine hundred forty three dollars. We've simply done a reclassification of how we'd like to budget that. And then I will mention that there there will be some additional interest earnings, and we'll we'll have to come back and do something of this nature for that. Depending on how quickly we spend the money. Um, it may only be to the tune of ten or twenty thousand dollars, but it, it will happen. <coughs> so the interest does have to roll back into to Zab. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. okay, explain that. We'll go back up a little bit again. Are you explain you're reallocating the five. Okay. So what we have right here. Initially, we had one million uh, for for all stadium repairs, stadium repairs and you drop, improvements. You dropped it down to five sixty. That's what's unspent. Unspent. So, uh, as it stands right now, um, either either spent or if you scroll up to the top, you can see the header when it showed. It. Okay. So, are we are we still going to do stadium repairs? Yeah. Well, I think the absolute. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah. I, I mean, think to, get us, to get us through the safety, the requirements for, I mean, they're still. Right, okay, all right, so I just wanna make sure it's <coughs> you from a safety standpoint, but then so it's to be done by, before the, the new school year starts. Uh, you're, not, you're not taking those funds away from that, are you? Because you're saying you're, uh, 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 Scroll down, if you would, to the stadium line on it. What we're there. saying is we can leave $560,000. Okay, okay available to to, okay, gotcha. to use right, that's what all right and then we're, and then we're we're going to do those other capital improvements to jefferson and and um the correct equipment and all that that you just indicated correct okay gotcha and the security entrances and the security entrances and that's what you indicated by the asterisks that you the capital improvements up there okay correct okay, cool. okay i'm with you now okay now all right i'm sorry now the 350 per security entrance right now that's a, a guesstimated it amount. is that's yeah we don't have anything right, down, right? that's so based on some preliminary conversations yeah. with the architect um it, it it may come in less than that um but but their best guess is between five and seven hundred thousand yeah, and, and really I just simply divided it in half. I have no idea. I know that one's going to be a little more than the other. So, but by doing this, what, what, what we accomplish is those, those items that were being requested through the budgetary process, those really are one-time items mm -hmm. um, and, and would typically be considered for a fund balance allocation if you have fund balance uh, available to do so. If you don't, then you, you know, you've got to do the budgetary process. But um, choose that dollar to be spent. It, it's really a timing issue that, that's yeah. driving this more than anything. But do those uh, expenditures have to be approved by the state, or is it totally up to us? Uh, but there's no formal process. There's a there's criteria, and we run all of our um, analysis or decision making through bond council just to verify if it's questionable i mean some things are are very obvious um there aren't really a lot of requirements when it comes to what qualifies for qzap primary things are it, it um it can't be of a construction <coughs> nature to the extent that it's outside the existing footprint of a building right. so you could put in walls in a, in a in an interior room like this and it's okay so remodeling is fine you can spend it on equipment that's fine but it all has to be associated with a campus that is um, for free and reduced children in excess of 35% of that campus. We don't have any campuses that don't qualify in that. So, so the location, as long as it's housing students, you're okay. The primary thing is you to make sure that it's, it's not uh, construction of building outside the, the footprint of the building. 
And uh, where it gets a little tricky is when you're, you're doing something that you're not sure if it's a building or not, like say a parking lot, that's, you know, some would argue, and that would be the kind of thing we'd want to run through bond council just to make sure that, and even if they if they question it, they'll run it through the Attorney General's office, and that's been done a few times. So, but all of these are, I mean, these are, these are well within the guidelines, so. Mm -hmm. Anything that develops efficiency and, and increases or decreases the uh, energy use, whatever it will qualify. So. And, and really, uh, the, the energy component of QZAP, it, when, what you spend the dollars on, it doesn't necessarily have to address energy concerns. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the program is supposed to educate children in terms of uh, saving electricity. Because, you know, I mean, if you, if you build a, a you know, rehab a, a playground, that's not really going to conserve energy necessarily. Hopefully, it'll expend some energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little bit common. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi. All right. Oh, I have part. a question. It relates back to Rick Richard's uh, report about the uh, bond that is going to be payable in two, 2018. Uh, is that part of the general operating fund? It's not a part of your presentation here. The bond that it's, I'm not sure if I'm following. It's payable in 2018? It said it was. The one that qualifies for. Oh, it's non callable. Final maturity date 2018. <coughs> what page is it on? It's on page four of his presentation. Second line, Tech, tech School Building Bond Series 28. Final maturity is 8-15-2018. Is that part of our regular budget traveling? Uh, well, let's take a look here. Make sure I'm following what you're saying. Come on, Paul. Oh, it's, okay. We're just in the final, we're in the final stage. That's the 2008 bonds? Yeah. That's the, that's so the final payment. They, yeah, that's the final payment. That's the final payment. That's the final payment. That's the final payment. That's into our regular mm -hmm. into this yeah. okay. So, and the, and and that kind of that that's probably a really good example of when you were looking at the slide that showed the debt structure. The very next page, actually. And Victor, I'm I'm jumping in, in on my own, but, but, but please feel free. <laughs> uh, but get, right. So in 2018, that bond drops off. You see a little dip there, but then you see it go back up. And we're not issuing any new debt. What that tells us, or what that tells me. Um, is that likely the structure of the other debt was compensating for that one falling off. In addition to, we refinanced the 2008 also, so this was the portion that we did not refinance, and so some of that is still out there. We just reduced that gray area right there and reduced the interest cost. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the downside. Sometimes you'll have debt fall off, but your actual annual payment may not change significantly because of the way it was structured. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate Victor's work in getting our bonds reduced by refinancing a year or so ago and that was a big help to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, six, 15, 16 was a busy year. Yeah, well, it's low interest rates. Several. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. Well, if there are no further questions, I'm going to move for a slight adjournment to the digital action. So, five minutes, everybody. An application, and you get approval, but there's no money in the exchange. There's no money exchange. So, those are some things other districts are doing, and those are some options um, that um, that we can have, and we would work with Mr. Schultz and. Um, and making sure that we're we're filing appropriately. If we decide to go that route in trademark, um, we're filing appropriately. I think it, we'd have to dis um, also look at what we want to trademark. Do we want to trademark the the matador for the high school? And do we want to trademark, uh, for example, uh, the example I, I gave that <coughs> Mr. Caruga had in his. Um, in his presentation. Do we want to tr trademark one of these as a district logo? Um, we have a new strategic plan, plan, plan passed. Um, we have a new leader in the seat at the district. Do we want to look at possibly redesigning a logo? 
or considering um, adding a logo and making it the official logo and phasing some of these out. Um, you know, that's, an, that's another option. So there's, there's a lot to consider out there. Even if we phase them out, they're still out there. Well, <laughs> and that is, that's yeah. they are still out there. Apparently it's still, um, that one's that one. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> we, can, we can trademark, we can and sort of register a trademark for the phrase Seguin Matadors. And again, we can ask to have, um, you know, if, a, if Walmart wants to print the t-shirts, they come through us. We either charge them money or we grant them the authority to do so. Um, but what, what it doesn't do is, if they don't want to pay or if they don't want to deal with us, it doesn't prohibit them from doing a black shirt with Seguin mm -hmm. in gold or Matadors in gold. Um, you know, individually the phrases can't be trademarked, but if we, once we put them together, that's something that we can. So. Um, there are loopholes like that out there if we do go to the trademark. Yeah. So, um, yes, ma'am. Can you just give me your perspective as a business owner? Mm -hmm. You charge a business who's going to print t shirts or whatever, uh -huh. 250 or $500, so you're just going to turn around and they're going to pass that cost on. Uh -huh. it's gonna, it, it, sure. You may make money up front, but it's going to end up costing right. more in the long run. Right. Well, and then there is, um, to dovetail that thought, um, I've also heard from districts who that's the intent because that way they get people buying t-shirts from the booster clubs and that way the booster club is getting that income to go back to the students as opposed to a business in town getting that. So I'm not condoning that, um, I'm just giving an example of that's, um, at some districts that's, that's the intent of charging that, that fee for outside usage. Mm -hmm. Yes sir. Are there any other Matador? Uh, yeah. Not that I know of. Well, Paso and California. Uh, yeah. I'm searching the mascots. The Texas Tech Red Raiders used to be Matadors, and actually they still have Matadors in their fight song, but they've actually changed to Red Raiders now. Uh, 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 so that was just some research, because they already have a uh, Matador. Sure. Done. Yeah, and we will, I think we'll, we would definitely do that just to make sure we're not trying to trademark something that's already trademarked. Uh, and, and a few years back when high schools got into this uh, kind of um, this movement to trademark their, their mascots and their logos, you saw a lot of that to where whether they knew it or not, they'd adopted a, a, co a collegiate logo. Um, and then they went to trademark it and then there were a lot of colleges and universities out there saying, uh, no, 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 we've already, you know, this is ours. Um, and you have to go and change it. So. So anyways, that's, that's kind of um, where we are, what we've looked at, and what we're, what we're considering. And um, yes, sir? Well, I, I just appreciate the work on it, because I mean, this came up because uh, at one of the conferences they were talking about it, and so I started looking into all of our logos, and I'm like, man, there's, there's a vast majority of what we have out there. And so I appreciate the looking into it. Uh, I think as a, as a district, we just want to send on a, a, a consistent, consistent similar message of, of what we are sure um, you know there's several logos in here that are very rep representative of who we are right uh, there are a few that are outdated and look and could actually maybe we can modify them a little bit and clean them up and sure and I think the, the old square one it looks pretty mm -hmm. uh, elementary yeah so that way Mm -hmm. I think you really have to protect your logo though because let's just say a charter school comes in and says yeah. we're going to be the Matadors yeah. two, three miles down the road. Right. And they have right. a, they have a you know, trademark. And, and that and that was also what they're saying you can't be the Matadors. And, and that's what these people were talking about when in the conference was you know somebody tried to come in and and they were it was a race to the finish to see who could. Right, secure that particular logo with that name. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity to really brand ourselves, and um, it's just. So we're, we're going through a new strategic are, plan, and, and so I think the not, timing you know, is. It's timing is right. Good. As we roll out the strategic plan over the summer, we need to do this at the summer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we do have an action item. Action item. 3A, it's 
D9C resolution regarding the Office of Governor's Truancy Prevention Grant. Yes. Uh, this actually, yeah, this is a this is a workshop. First so question. Yeah. This is a workshop. We can't take we can't take action in the workshop. Did you review this? The the uh, Open Meetings Act doesn't define sure? workshop. Okay. And it, uh, okay. if you post that you're going to take action at a meeting, you can take action. Even though it's classified as a workshop. There is no legal definition okay. of workshop in the Open Meetings Act. Huh? Huh? I believe you can. Okay. All right. Uh, because we don't tell like that before. Because we always close. Because we closed it, and then we open, and then we, and then we started the. Uh, we always opened up as a as a board as a board meeting. I was just want to make sure. This is just a classification of the type of meeting you're having. It's the, again, like if it's properly okay. posted as an action item at a, at a a meeting, a called meeting, you can take the okay the action. All right, we're good. Timelines and everything. So yeah, we we asked that question before we did this okay. too, not knowing if we needed yeah. to wait till the end of the month. I want to make sure we don't buy I don't know if we could wait. But that was the whole point is this was kind of a timeliness issue. So um, so what this is, and hopefully this really doesn't take much time, but yes. the Office of the Governor opened up a grant opportunity through their Criminal Justice Division for Truancy Prevention and Intervention Program uh, to provide funding specifically for what's called truancy case managers. And that is normally going through a truancy court when the law decriminalized truancy, uh, they've been collecting um, money through municipal courts and counties, uh, little $2 per ticket, and that has been going to the state, 50% of it, 50% staying with the local communities. So that money's been accumulated. So this grant allows school districts as well as municipalities and counties, if they have truancy courts, to get case managers to work these cases. But we have a unique situation here in Seguin in that we do not have a truancy court. Neither Guadalupe Bay County nor the city of Seguin has issued any court to be the truancy court, even though the law says to do that. So, as a Seguin ISD, we can apply to have a case manager help us with our truancy interventions and attempt to help facilitate the um, creation of a truancy court through either the county or the city. So that's <laughs> what we have applied to uh, the state to do. Um, so what we need from the, from the board is a resolution regarding the submission of this grant in the hopes that we get it. Um, and so what this resolution states is that since this is an uh, open grant that, and that we do not have a truancy court here, and that we would like a truancy case manager to benefit the district um, with all attendance, but specifically truancy, um, the things that are designated that have to be in the resolution, uh, that we call the missing matadors matter, because again, missing matadors very much matter to us, and it authorizes the uh, superintendent to apply for, accept, reject, alter, terminate the grant, and that if any uh, grant funds are lost or misused, the it would go back to the state and that there are no matching funds as part of this grant. So what I'm asking you all to do tonight is uh, sign the resolution so that we can submit that and we're uh, in process with the governor's office to get this um, grant and hopefully we'll receive it. Any questions? Need a motion? I need a motion. I, I'll, I'll <laughs> motion that we approve the uh, resolution regarding the Office of the Governor's Truancy Prevention Grant. Thank you, Mr. Holt. Can I have a second, please? Raise this hand. Does that matter? As long as we get it done, then we get some, some people in here. So I have a motion to um, approve the resolution regarding the Office of the Governor's Truancy Prevention Grant. And second, is there any further discussion? Everybody in, I'm sorry, oh, Mr. Amador. Okay. <laughs> Everybody in favor, raise your right hand. Approved. I mean, I can't say It okay. is approved. Okay. Session. Motion I carries. Right. Right. Yes, it. Okay. All right. Um, item number four, closed session. We will be going into closed session. It is 9:10. Does anybody need a break before we head in there? Okay. Let's do it. In at. 
1007, the two clocks are different. But <laughs> and there will be no action this evening as a result of a closed session. So do I hear a motion to adjourn? Oh, Mr. Juarez, seconded by Mr. Amador. All in favor, say aye. 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 So we adjourn it in a way. <laughs>